All right, so um, today I'm going to just talk about how ocean processes, um, you know, drive and shape coral reef ecosystems and sort of use the, the Western Australia coastline as a, as a case study to look at these um, dynamics. Okay, so Jim talked a bit about these, these challenges with scale if we're going to predict, you know, the future of reefs with, um, in respect to climate change. So if we think of, you know, diagrams like this, that the ocean contains a wide range of different um, hydrodynamic and, and different water motion kind of processes that affect things like temperature variability on different scales. So if we think about really small scale processes like waves breaking on reefs, those are, you know, order 10, 10 meters or so. Um, t going up to, to tidal motions, um, ocean boundary currents like the Lewin Current or the East Australian Current on this coast. Um, and then all, all the way up to sort of ocean basin scale um, drivers that drive things like the ENSO cycle. Um, the focus of this, this talk is, is really going to be on these, these shelf and, and reef scale processes, which, as Jim was already showing an example, drive a lot of you know, the circulation and the in, in implications for temperature variability and so on. Um, the, just to show some examples, if you look, this is a photo of Ningalo, so this ties in with what Jim talked about, that a lot of the, the circulation and the physical variability occurs over relatively small scales on the order of hundreds of meters within reefs like Ningaloo. And then this is um, showing a photo of, so Ningaloo Reef is along, along this, Ning this um, Northwest Cape region. And you can see an example of, a, of an upwelling event during summer where the temperature in a thin strip about um, on the order of a kilometer to, to five kilometers along this coast is actually five degrees cooler. Um, so there's also important shelf processes that won't, that can't be predict, picked up by you know, uh, global uh, circulation models, um, things like NOAA's Coral Reef Watch, you know, SST kind of products that aren't resolving down to sub kilometer scales. And also if we're looking into the future, even though typical GCMs have um, resolutions of a degree or, you know, on the order of 100 kilometers, there's been some work looking at the effectiveness of the hindcast predictions and re reproducing some of the dynamics. And these studies have found that actually the predictive skill sort of drops off at, you know, on the order of four to eight degrees, so on the, up to, you know, 800 kilometers. So we're really not resolving these, these important processes um, that influence reefs. Okay, so the, the WA coast in many ways is an ideal environment to, to look at these um, dynamics. Um, as Jim was highlighting, um, on, on the scale of individual reefs, it really tends to be wave forcing as, or, or tidal forcing that really dominates the, the, the circulation in, in, um, on these reefs. And so if we look at, um, this is an annual mean um, wave energy plot, which is related to wave height, we see that the west coast of Australia gets a substantial amount of, of wave energy. But if we go up into the Pilbara and then the Kimberley, you can see that on, on average, the, there's, um, it's relatively sheltered. But this area also gets episodic extreme kind of events um, due to cyclones, which I'll discuss. But interestingly, if we look at the tides um, along Western Australia, it's, it's flipped. So in, this, in the southern part of Australia, we have um, really low tides, so microtidal kind of region. But if we go up into the, the Kimberley, it has, it's the largest um, tidal range any, in any tropical region in the world, up to, to 10 meters. So we sort of have these going from wave-dominated reefs to, to tide-dominated reefs in the, in the far northwest. And then I'll talk a bit about some of these shelf-scale drivers. So um, John Pandolfi was talking about, you know, the poleward migration of, of um, you know, different species as, as in, in response to, you know, the tra trajectories of ocean boundary currents like the East Australian Current. On the West Coast, we have the Lewin Current, which you can see here is, is important because it moves, it transport heat, transports heat down the, the coastline, as you can see here. So this is important for really setting up the, the, the marine climate along Western Australia. And then there's also kind of shelf scale processes that, that drive extreme variability that are, that are also at these um, at these scales. All right, so what I want to talk about um, first is these um, class of, of wave-dominated reef systems. And Jim talked a bit about Ningaloo Reef. Um, this is an area that gets a substantial amount of wave energy and the basic mechanics of that, so if you look at um, a place like Ningaloo where you see wave breaking, you know, when you go, say, swimming on a beach and a wave breaks on you, you feel the force of that wave impacting. What waves do when they break on a reef or on a beach is they, they push, the force pushes water towards shore, so you move water across the reef flat 
into the lagoon and that exits back to the ocean through the channel. So it's really sort of um, almost like a wave pump, which is these, these waves are pumping water and, and really controlling the circulation and importantly, the exchange of water between um, offshore and, and onshore. Um, just to show how, how important waves are to, to the circulation of places like Ningaloo, this is just um, some field data just showing at three locations on the, on the reef where you can see on the y-axis is the, the current speed. The x-axis is just the offshore wave height, and you can see that very strong correlations, um, even though there's tides operating and, and winds and so on, it's really, you know, waves are really dominantly driving the, the flow. As Jim talked about as well, it's the, it, the, the actual magnitude of, of the flows that you get are really also tightly coupled into the particular morphology of different reefs, as well as, as bottom, friction, bottom friction. So if we have, um, you know, coral reefs form large roughness on the seafloor, that also can, can reduce and restrict the flow and slow down. Um, so this is important because all of this controls the residence time, so the time scale of which water um, moves through a reef system and, and returns back to the ocean. Um, the, Jim's talk, he, he highlighted um, the coral base. I won't provide um, uh, background, but one of the things that I do is develop um, numerical kind of process-based models to predict um, circulation, and this involves coupling wave models with, with circulation models. Um, and this is a useful kind of movie just to highlight um, some of the, the extreme spatial variability you can find even over very small scales on, the, on these reefs. So essentially taking this model and seeding it with numerical particles. Um, for reference, the, the reef crest is sort of here and there's a few channels. And one of the, the important things is you can see that there's clear transport barriers established. There's retention zones, so there's areas that are accumulating material. There's areas that also tend to just want to disperse material. So there's a lot of fine scale variability on these reefs, and it's largely connected to um, the, the effect of, of on, on residence times. So you can see, as um, Jim was talking about, that there's huge variability and huge gradients in residence times over these small scales going you know, from an, almost an order of magnitude variation. So all of this has important consequences for understanding you know, fine scale patterns of, of coral bleaching, uh, fine scale connectivity and, and recruitment patterns, nutrient recycling, so as water moves through the, re the reef and, and, and um, transformed and recycled. Um, and I won't really um, emphasize this much, but um, Jim talked about that, so I'll skip. So it has major implications for understanding the thermal environments of these, these types of reef where you get substantial amplifications of um, the inshore reef waters. What I want to uh, talk about now is going to the other end of the spectrum, which is if we go up into the, the, the far northwest of um, Australia into the, the Kimberley. So this is an area that has um, up to 12 meter tides in some areas. It has numerous coral reef systems that, that are often found in these intertidal kind of platforms. And we're starting to do quite a bit of work in these areas, but they're still fairly, it's given its remoteness and lack of historical work, it's still largely unexplored. But I'll talk about some of these, these um, reefs. So one of the, the fundamental differences in, in these reefs is with this huge tidal range, um, we, we've noticed that and a lot of these reefs form these, these terraces along the edge. These are um, crustless coral and algal kind of terraces that when the water falls, you get essentially a, water, a waterfall as flowing off the reef as the, the water drains off. And one of the interesting things is um, if you go to, say, you know, rivers, you've often noticed things, structures like this, which are, are weirs, which engineers put into rivers to actually slow and impede the flow of water. So these are, um, it creates what's called um, in engineering a hydraulic control. So the presence of these kind of waterfall features really re restricts the water from, from flowing off the reef. And what you're left with is actually, even though the water level can fall, you know, five meters below offshore, you end up with, with pools of water and these reefs never, never dry out. And you can see that in, in data like this, which is some recent um, field work on a reef at Tallinn, which has a really well-defined terrace along, along the edge. And you can see the blue lines are the offshore um, tidal variability, so you can see huge um, fluctuations. But if we actually look at the, the water level on the reef, it's substantially damped. 
And in particular, it's very asymmetric. So you see as the water level rises above the reef, you get, it rapidly floods, so you get a tidal bore that comes across. But then it, it drains off very slowly to, due to this hydraulic control. So it's this process that, that really reduces the exchange of water and it allows you to have you know, water sticking on top of the, the reef. The consequence is by reducing the exchange of water, um, what you find in these reefs are really you know, extreme physical and biogeochemical variations. So this is work by Rene um, Gruber, a PhD student, who um, what, what's plotted here, if we just focus on the red lines, what you can see are these are just temperature variations. So you can find that when you have periods of low tide with in, in the midday, you can get rapid and, and huge increases in temperature, um, increasing from say you know 26 degrees up to 36 degrees in a matter of a, you know hours. Um, likewise, in terms of biogeochemistry, there's a lot of reactions that dramatically change the, the water chemistry. Um, just as an example of dissolved um, oxygen, so that's the blue line going, this is equivalent to you know, 300% saturation. Going all the way at night, when you have the reverse situation, going to really anoxic kind of levels um, in night. So, so the consequence of this trapping of water in these pools is these extreme um, physical and biogeochemical variations. Okay, the last thing I did want to do is just um, spend a few moments just talking about some of these intermediate kind of shelf scale processes and how they're really important to understanding um, physical variability on reefs. So you've, we talked a bit about um, and have the same thing on the East Coast where there's, there's an ocean boundary current system, which is a Lewin current um, that, that is important because it moves warm water down, down the coast. Um, but Jim sort of talked about this, this 2011 heat wave that we had a strong La Nina period. And when the La Nina, when, uh, during La Nina periods, you get a strengthening of the Lewin current. So we had a really strong Lewin current that moved a lot of heat down this coast and um, generated a five degree temperature um, anomaly. So this resulted in sort of unprecedented bleaching in many um, regions of, of WA. Um, for example, at Ningaloo, there hadn't been really well documented, um, any historical cases of mass kind of bleaching, but there was significant bleaching in areas in Ingaloo. And the final thing I want to, um, one of the final things I want to talk about is um, really beware of, of kind of current maps like this, where you know it shows suggests that you have really have these these ocean current patterns that are important for um, establishing the the thermal environment. Because if we actually look at Ningaloo, so this is from a numerical model looking, um, or regional ocean model, where we're nesting in a fine scale model. So Ningaloo Reef is along this coastline. And I just want to show how transient the, you know, the, the conditions really are, including a lot of upwelling happening on these reefs, coastal eddies, the encroachment of these eddies on and offshore. Um, and so if we focus on the right panel, here you can see that there's a, a constant um, oscillation. So you get warming as, as you get the Lewin current strengthening. Then you get wind events that reverse the flow. And you can see if I stop here, you can see you get cooling as the, the winds um, pick up and reverse the, the, the shelf flow. And what this is causing is substantial upwelling happening along, along Ningaloo. And then the winds relax again and you get downwelling. And so it's this, this constant cycle. And the, the, the implications for this, again, going to the importance of, of scales, is if we look at um, the, this is using one kilometer um, SST imagery, that you can see that historically in the summer there's on average um, this tongue of, of, blue, of a blue, which is the, the SST. So on average in this narrow strip of a few kilometers, you have temperatures that are, that are on the order of um, three, three degrees or so cooler. Um, and this is really driven by, by upwelling. And the same thing with the, the temperature variability. So you can see that in models like this, you get the uplift of the isotherms and an uplift in the, the velocities. This also just, just highlights how, how transient kind of these, these processes are. Um, if we look at, this is field work looking at the, the shelf currents. This is the longshore current. So essentially it's going north when, when it's positive and then south. And so you, what you see on this coast is every week, one to two weeks, you get this oscillation of the flow going north, south, north, south, which causes upwelling, downwelling, and, and so on. And what we've done and shown is that this is tied into the, the, what's called the synoptic weather band. So the time scale on this coastline through which you have wind patterns coming through is on the order of one to two weeks, and it's driving a lot of this, this variability. So, so the ocean is very 
you know, it's non-steady. You don't have constant current systems along this coast, and this drives a substantial temperature variability. Okay, the last last slide is um, just want to just acknowledge that that cyclones are obviously also very important along this coast. If um, we look at the Pilbara coastline, it's it's the most severely impacted. It gets the most severe um, tropical cyclone impacts in these these red areas. There's very little work, at least on the inshore areas of the, the Pilbara, on, on, on the impacts of these, these cyclones. The most obvious effect is, is waves, so we're doing some work looking at um, running wave models and looking at how that can predict some of the, the disturbances and the impacts of cyclones along the coast. But one of the other important aspects of cyclones is they impart a huge amount of, wave, a huge amount of energy into the ocean and they stir up and mix, mix the ocean. So, for example, some data we had on the, the northwest shelf um, what you can see here is this is temp thermistor data. If we talk, the surface is this top line. So when Cyclone Glenda went through, it decreased the temperature by by four degrees over well, when the cyclone passed. And then if I kept going, it, would, it essentially takes almost a month for this whole you know system to recover and restratify. And given that the Pilbara, you have two to three cyclones like this each year, you know this can also be an important process to to consider. Okay, so just to to summarize. Um, I think I just wanted to emphasize that the, the causes of ocean variability on reefs it can really be swamped by, by processes that we're not really resolving well, things that are occurring on the shelf in fine scale dynamics. We get very different um, responses depending on whether we get wave driven or, or tide dump, uh, driven reefs, and this also depends strongly on the, the morphology. Um, so even very small perturbations to these, these ocean boundary currents, as we saw in that heat wave event, you know, can have a, a dramatic impact on, on these reefs by just completely changing the, the, the heat advection and, and upwelling, downwelling cycle. And so it really is, is clear that, that predicting the future of reefs, it, it depends not simply just on, on climate models and predicting how the ocean basins are going to change, but also trying to understand these, these local and regional um, effects. And so just to um, thank funding sources, um, PhD students who contributed to this work and, and range of collaborators. Thanks. <laughs>